coming to you live, but not really. It is all pump and no circumstance with Ryder Richards on letusthinkaboutit.com, the amateur hour you should never tune into. Welcome back. This is Ryder Richards. So we're going to continue with Rene Girard's ideas. That is moving from step 69's mimetic desire, which in short is a way of wanting what others want and thus acting to pursue the same object or goals as others. So it's mimicry, right? It's imitative. And we're going to start thinking more about how that shifts into an imitation loop of failure that provokes violence. So Rather than identical mirroring, the way to be different actually creates an inverse, uh, but it's kind of a parallel path here. So one way to win is to attain the goal, such as success or the car or the job or the perfect sexy partner as somebody else, right? But here's the problem is once my rival has that, I can't directly copy it or I'm just a copycat, right? So I adopt a similar but parallel set of desires. So all of a sudden I want a truck rather than a car. I want to start a company rather than get promoted at my current company. So the key point here is to attain the goal begins a recursive loop because desire will always generate a new goal for new pursuit. And the goal you attained was never authentically yours anyway but it was merely a desire modeled for you either by somebody else or by society at large. So, hooray, you captured the flag. But of course, now you find that you never wanted that dirty flag, right? You just wanted to win the entire time. So guess what? You have to play again and again. And you're never going to be satisfied long-term because there will always be another win to have, right? Another game to play. So what's so dumb about being stuck on this desire treadmill? and yet of course we all do it, is that we're chasing what others want simply because they want it. Their desires are not going to fulfill you. And it probably isn't even their desire anyway, which makes it all the worse, right? Even more shallow and dumb, but it was all modeled for them by somebody else, right? Some sort of propaganda, like a Baronet's kind of thing, right? So once you see the illusion, mimetic modeling starts to break down. So the unfortunate part about a lot of this is in our society, a lot of us do not capture the flag, right? So we end up never knowing or having the experience to really know that it's an illusory victory at the highest levels. We maybe are capturing small flags, but not the big one. So we hold out hope that our implanted dreams will make us into a real boy, just like Pinocchio or maybe Deckard in Blade Runner. We're programmed automatons who will never capture the flag, the prom queen or king, and even ourselves, we're missing out on ourselves. And this is because we are at heart desiring machines. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later. Now, in such a depressing loop, our rage by not achieving builds up. We feel thwarted, thwarted all around by everyone and everything. Rene Girard says that this jealousy, envy, and anger creates the need for scapegoating on a social level. So in short, our failure to attain is flipped from anger at ourselves and just society in general, and of course the love interest who rejects us, into hate for someone else, an outsider. The internal failure becomes external violence, and this is always directed away from our social circle to an outsider. So you ask rhetorically, writer, How is any of this tied in with cybernetic theory or accelerationism? Okay, so in step 66, the positive energies within a system, this is cybernetics, they can be regulated. And the problem is if you don't regulate them, the ship will steer off course. Now what happens here is if you consider the thermostat analogy, well, the house becomes either too hot or too cold. So essentially the positive energies that could be hot or cold are when a system keeps leaning in the direction it wants to lean, right? Which has to be moderated by negative energies or regulation. So scapegoating is the social steam whistle. When pressure gets too high, well, we scapegoat. We go to war. We get involved in violence. Now the trade-off is we do not explode our society. Hooray, right? But instead we channel our violence onto another person, an outsider, a stranger, someone we can beat up on and make ourselves feel good about. At least for a moment until we have to do it again later under more pressure. So 
anyway, these ideas are really mind blowing. And if you look at the political scene and all this kind of stuff, and I'm not going to get into it, but you can see how meme wars and the right and the left and Antifa and the alt right are all kind of doing these things. But what I'm going to do in this episode is not jump into that, but instead I'm going to lightly introduce Lacan's idea of the objet petit a, this is also known as the little other, and I'm going to compare the scapegoating mechanism to George Bataille's notion of sacrifice. And this all comes from his text, uh, The Accursed Share, Volume 1. So, a lot to cover today, let's jump into it. Part 1 Recap Desire is not of this world. It is in order to penetrate into another world that one desires. It is in order to be initiated into a radically foreign existence. That's Rene Girard. Now, as a little recap on mimetic desire, people, of course, tend to crave and desire the same thing, whether that's an object, a status, or a person. They fixate, and then they converge on the object which of course leads to violence when we're chasing the same thing. And there's only one of them, right? Because we both want it. It's like kids on a playground. So what's so strange about this is often somebody else has to introduce and model for you that that something is desirable. So when you're on the playground, I didn't actually want that shiny rock until they wanted it. And now I must have it, right? I mean, this is so silly. Here's the thing is we don't have our own ideas very often of what is desirable. We look around to others to tell us what to desire. Gerard refers to these introducers of desire as mediators who model desire, and this is desire for fulfillment, right? This is going to fulfill you or make you whole. And of course, this is all socially based, and it only works when the model is hidden. So this is kind of like uh, once you recognize the model, then it's like recognizing reverse psychology or gaslighting, right? It seems very obvious and it ceases to work on you most of the time. Unless you're, of course, maybe a narcissist, right? <laughs> and then you think everything is gaslighting. <laughs> so anyway, Gerard says that our goal is to expose these little hidden systems so that we do not act unconsciously, unthinkingly, or under their sway. Now, of course, I said these are little systems, but they're huge. It's probably powering the entire world when you really start thinking about it. But of course, let's get back to this introduction of the desire by a mediator. How does this play out, right? Well, first, we're going to talk about the individual, right, and how that works for them. Then in the next section, I'm really going to play out on a larger scale how Gerard says it works on the social level. Now, when the mediator well, this person can be your buddy, a television ad, or the serpent in the garden. It can also be the society that you live in. Now, consider when you want an object. Like, of course, I currently want an espresso machine. <laughs> and I can argue with myself about the cost-benefit analysis, right? Quality versus cost. I can get into all sorts of details and get really nuanced on this. And it can start to feel rational because I'm making all these minor decisions along the way, even though this is obviously a luxury item, right? <laughs> and this is, as Jürgen Habermas calls it, this is instrumental rationality. This is only reasoning to get to a goal. So what happens is I adjust the means to reach the ends. But the goal itself, the ends, it's not rational. <laughs> because I live next to five coffee shops and it will take me 10 years to pay off this crazy espresso machine that truly is who I am, right? <laughs> this is so wild. And more counterintuitively, even if I had an espresso machine at home, I would then end up robbing myself of the socialization and status of being a known espresso guy at the coffee shop where this idea was originally modeled for me. So this is wild, right? Um, but we can get really caught up in this game. So when we pursue something less tangible, right, such as the social status of being an espresso aficionado, well, all of a sudden, this is kind of socially manufactured, it's marketed to us, and there becomes a lot of room for even more rationalizations, which is really all we need in life, right? Coffee and rationalization. <laughs> yeah, so write that down, kids. I never go a day without coffee and rationalization. <laughs> okay, so anyway. We are trying to be kind of like someone, or maybe we're trying to be different than someone, right? Mm, I don't know about this. Are we attempting to be an authentic individual here? Ah, no, not really, right? What we're trying to be is a type of person. I want to be a type of someone who drinks espresso, maybe barefoot, right? On a yoga ball, maybe. 
well shaving with a straight razor and yet I still want to have a luxurious beard. <laughs> it's all very confusing to know who you are in these days. And of course, it also requires a lot of ambidexterity and maybe a few trips to the ER. But anyway, back to it to clarify here. We pursue similarity, but with small differences, with differentiation. So you can try to be quirky and smart, you know, while your rival is actually attempting to be stable and conservative. And this is all to gain the same goal. Yet this behavior, it's actually imitative, even though it's really done in inverse. So by reacting to each other in the same tiny social circle, you're forming a closed loop of pursuit through small differences, which of course you exaggerate as big differences. Johnny goes barefoot, so hmm, I'm gonna wear turtlenecks, <laughs> right? But of course, at the end of the day, we're both Silicon Valley bros, right, bro? Yeah, hey. So psychologically, even if you define yourself through negation, it obscures you from ever pursuing who you really are or might be. You react blindly, stupidly, and we all do it. Now, if we apply this stupidity at a social level, as we're about to look at, it leads to tragedy. Part two, the scapegoating machine. A scapegoat remains effective as long as we believe in its guilt. Having a scapegoat means not knowing that we have one. Now, in ancient times, there was always somebody that you could scapegoat, and this person might be named Judas, and Pontius Pilate could scapegoat Jesus, right? Or it might just be a guy named Ralph that's out on the corner. Could also be a woman named Mary, who you accuse of something sexually, right? Now, sometimes the crops, in a society just wouldn't come in, right? There'd be a drought or maybe there'd be a disease that would ravage the land and the people were angry about it, right? Now, you could also say that a guy named Jesus was cruising around upsetting the social order by preaching peace. Oh, nothing pisses people off like peace. <laughs> Telling them they should control their violence? Urgh, well, I'll show him. <laughs> oh, Yeah, so anyway, what is curious is that Rene Girard, through Luke Burgess's book, and that's where I got this. He implies that disease may not have been a pathogen or a virus, not like COVID, but it could have just been anger in the old days. So disease might have just been anger, an evil spirit plaguing the land, and it was really just this kind of rambunctious, ornery frustration was all pent up, and dad blam it, I'm about to boil over and burn down the town, right? So what is the cure for that? Well, Gerard says we have to find a way to relieve the anger in a way that people would not necessarily blame themselves, but they could somehow release and feel vindicated. So you have to give them a cathartic release that wouldn't make them feel guilty later. And this is so they could remain productive members of society, right? Because this is cybernetics here. This is the release valve. So we have the release valve going off so that we can save society. So we're not trying to make these people feel guilty so that they break society. So the best way to do this is really to point out Ralph, who of course was the social outcast. And maybe it's because he had dandruff. I don't know, maybe he liked licking frogs. Ralph was just weird. But focus all your attention on Ralph. Or perhaps you just accuse a woman who turned you down at prom and you say she's an adulteress. <sighs> Which is, of course, as we know, why all the crops are not growing. <laughs> and then you just wait. Now, this is what's crazy, is the hardest part comes next, which is the rage just builds and builds and people work themselves up, but they don't know what to do with all of that rage until someone throws the first stone. So this bottled up rage is present, but someone actually has to stand out from the crowd and create the model. They have to light the match for the rest of the crowd to follow. But of course, there's always gonna be some sort of, I don't know, sociopathic jackass that's gonna do it. And then the mob mentality takes over. As the modeled action spreads, everyone gets to hurl stones and I will get to sort of purge their anger as a social group. They're killing the disease. You pointed out this person said they are the disease, kill them, which means now everyone in the group says, well, it wasn't my stone that killed them. We were all doing it, just like they say on the playground, right? So. This is horrible because it dissipates responsibility from the individual while also sort of allowing cathartic murder. So this is like a firing squad and you just get to say, well, I don't know, I close my eyes when I pull the trigger. But you're still part of the firing squad, right? So once again, mom mentality or group participation alleviates individual responsibility until no one is to blame. So 
What happened is we just found a social outsider, Ralph, and we killed them to release pressure. So this person, this scapegoat, they serve a brutal, dumb, utilitarian function. Some people would say this is necessary for the good of society, which I think, I don't know, uh, a good argument against that is Ursula K. Le Guin's short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Amelis. Now, in this story, there is this beautiful, utopic, happy society. It is a perfect society full of happy people, and everyone loves being there, sort of. Because, of course, there's a dark secret here, and the secret to everyone's happiness is that to create happiness, there has to be a twisted bargain, where a single child must suffer for everyone else's happiness. So this child is tortured every day for thousands of people to be happy. So happiness is created by violating and condemning one. Now, of course, this is an argument against mathematical utilitarianism. It's the greatest happiness principle by John Stuart Mill, where you kind of aggregate happiness and the aggregate actually gets to trump the rights of an individual. And this is how we create the scapegoat. The scapegoat is that individual. So happiness of most requires a sacrifice of one. So ancient civilizations, they made this deal all the time. They were actually totally cool with it. Now, as Gerard says, examine ancient sources, inquire everywhere, dig up corners of the planet, and you will not find anything anywhere that even remotely resembles our modern concern for victims. In ancient Greece, it was common to single out and condemn. In religious cultures, of course, God or gods would have you sacrifice not only animals to them, but people as well, maybe even your family members. And of course, we also have more modern examples that we can't pass up talking about, such as the Holocaust in Germany or the Tutsi in Rwanda. Now, there have been major changes that do push back against the sort of singular conception of scapegoating. And one of these is Christianity with Jesus, because Jesus is the ultimate scapegoat. He's sacrificed by his all-powerful father for our petty vindictive sins. And what this does is it flips the script of the scapegoat into a powerful martyr. So the scapegoat becomes the powerful one. This, the movement here shifts a social dynamic from condemning the weak. This is where the powerful burn or bludgeon through their bodies as a release for either societal rage or just for entertainment, because you can. And all of a sudden, there's this accepted ideology where the victimized weak were actually to be helped, and this allowed morality that allowed access to heaven. From this standpoint, you side with the victim, not against them. But of course, old habits are hard to break, and once Christians came to power, they couldn't help but just, you know, I don't know, running around killing some people, because, you know, if this is how you help them. I mean, it's so strange to think about uh, how power works like that. Like, for the weak, we will become powerful and, and loop those together. Anyway, this is still a kind of progress. It's a type of progress because now we have an alternate model for how to move through the world. And Gerard says we should note this modern concern for victims it really just hasn't come into civilizations on a broad scale before. Now, this does not, of course, mean we stop scapegoating. We just find other ways to do it. But in a more scientific vein, we could also take this tact on it. Gerard says, We didn't stop burning witches because we invented science. We invented science because we stopped burning witches. You stop the scapegoating, and then our rational brain kicks in. So we quit blaming people for droughts, and we started to consider weather patterns. Yet many people are not comforted by this. Scientific explanation for drought? Yeah, this does not save their starving child. And so the rage in people remains. And once again, we're in this cybernetic system. These are positive energies. And these positive energies demand release. So we need a regulation valve. So here's a question. In our modern times, under and within capitalism or democracy, have we just constrained the scapegoating mechanism, right? Or is it just shifted into something like social media takedowns, right? And here's what's funny is blaming social media just actually a red herring for the entire system. Is it just another level of governance and control, another sort of artificial negativity? Because when you really back up and look at it on a national or a state level, are we all just kind of hiding behind the law to continue scapegoating anyway? We still take our vengeance in violence. We still carve out our pound of flesh or we still imprison people but we do it in a civilized and legal, a justified professional manner. So what is law but a way to regulate, a way to scapegoat? 
and way to coercively correct for outsiders. Side note, the con and desire. So you might have heard of Lacan. He was this French philosopher and a psychoanalysis guy. Now, I most often bump into Lacan or Lacanian concepts, I don't know how you say it, whenever I am reading Slavoj Zizek. Once again, another thing I don't know how to say. To introduce some terms here, just so we can pretend we did our homework, right? Like we're an actual philosophy podcast. <laughs> Lacan says, there is a big other and a little other. Now, the big other is the objet ah, and the little other is the objet petit ah. <laughs> Now, the big other is, of course, the large symbolic structure that surrounds us, incentivizing us to work with others. While the little other is imaginary, and these are our desires that drive us. Now, the way this works is that we have a desire, and we might consider that desire as a goal that's out in front of us, such as the fruit of knowledge or the holy grail or a really tasty kumquat. Mm. But Lacan says that our goal is not our aim. Our aim is subconscious drives to continue desiring. So here it is. We can have a goal out in front of us. We can desire that thing or status or person. And yet to achieve that goal, oddly enough, does not completely satisfy us. You do not look around and say, oh, I am now complete. And then you just sit there and rest, right? Um, or maybe you do it for just a split second. And then you immediately find a new desire to pursue. Because as Lacan says, the subject is constituted from their desire. Okay, so the reason I bring all this up is because if Lacan is correct and our desire is what creates us as an individual, as a subject, it is how we know ourselves, then we can never be non-desiring without disintegrating the self. So while Buddhist enlightenment involves no longer suffering by no longer desiring, right? In the West and in most of the world, the big other, this is the large symbolic structure, let's say capitalism or commodification, this is pressuring us until the individual himself identifies with commodities. That's why Rene Girard's ideas of mimesis, wanting what you see in others, or identifying yourself with small differences, that's why it can lead to such large rivalries that become nation state rivalries. Now our current big other, even if Lacan says there is no big other and we only create the big other out of our little other, well, we're actually surrounded by a symbolic imperative of commodification. That's a pressure that's on us. Julian de Madero says, the Cartesian subject, the I think, therefore I am, has evolved into I commodify myself, therefore I exist. <laughs> Part three, scapegoat and sacrifice. We can look at the notion of scapegoating a couple of different ways, and we already have, right? Uh, previous episode through literature, there's the individual, there's society. There's also the notion of the economy. And there's this idea from George Bataille of the general economy, which is kind of natural, and it always produces excess and waste. Now, it's hard and odd to think about the economy in terms of waste when we think about it in terms of efficiency, scarcity, and control, and things like that. Now, in case you're unfamiliar, here is the idea in broad strokes. The natural economy only uses a very small percentage of the sunlight that hits the earth for anything for growth, right? And it transforms very little of this into productive energy. Most of it is just dissipated or wasted. Each plant only uses a tiny fraction of the sunlight that hits it, right? Each animal uh, chews up tons of food and barely consumes most of the calories in it, right? So this is all wasteful. And it gets even worse when it's like, you know, omnivores or carnivores eating other animals that ate grain. It's just horrible cycle here. It's all diminishing returns. Now, often animals also have a lot of young and very few of them survive. It's the same with seeds. It's the same with all of this kind of reproductive apparatus. So the way anything thrives or survives actually seems to be through excess, not moderation and limitation, which is the way we seem to consider an economy. So once again, the efficiency and scarcity mindset that you hear about is foreign to the general economy. Now this general or solar economy can be mapped onto many systems, including cybernetics, of course, but it maps very well onto biology and from there the individual, the social, and then the anthropologic aspect of humanity. 
So this gets back into Gerard. It explains a lot of contradictions that previously was just weird stuff we ignored because it didn't fit our rational mindset. Now to rationally model why we're irrational, <laughs> Well, yeah, that's a good one, right? I'm always interested in that. And there's some fairly common ground where Bataille and Gerard meet up here. Now, Bataille in The Accursed Share, Volume 1, talks about sacralizing our excesses through sacrifice. You have to do something with that excess. So at first this sounds odd because you're like, well, just save it, right? But when you have way, way, way too much, you actually have to kill it or burn it. This sacrifice levels back out the resources in a community in, you know, diminishing inequality by expending them in a kind of public debauchery, which is often sort of a ritual or some sort of something that's religiously mediated. Now, the Aztecs, the Bataille brings them up, they conquered all the surrounding villages, and yet they kept spreading, just like the Romans or Genghis Khan or any of these people. But slaves captured were brought back and what do you do with so much excessive wealth in the terms of flesh, right? Biopolitics here. Now, if you just kill them, you're a wasteful tyrant. You're a monster. But if you sacrifice them, hey, right, to your god on, say, a really nice altar, hey, put on a nice spectacle, rip out their beating hearts, right? Let tons of gallons of blood spill down a very expensive, nice pyramid, and you let it all run through the streets, stinking it up, and you call it praise. Well, you're doing it for the blessings of the people. So the excess becomes blessings. This becomes all about fertile crops or something. You come up with something, right? And what Bataille would say too, is that war itself is a kind of excess. Not only that, but it happens because we have too much. We have too much violence because we have too much excess. The tension among ourselves gets turned inward and we must turn it outward upon the outsider. All this jealousy and rage, right? We have to scapegoat somebody or somewhere because we have too much wealth and have to expend it. We have to burn it up. So we ritualize, <coughs> excuse me, rationalize this wasteful expenditure. We waste our own lives, we take theirs, and we accumulate more territory under patriotic fervor, right? This is a lot of lives and materials wasted on patriotism. And the next time we're under tension in our society, yeah, guess what we do? We channel the excessive intensity outward again, accumulating more excess, which we bring back, we get more jealous about, and we have to go out again and doing more war. So this is a deadly cycle to get started. Now, Bataille also says that the Aztecs, oddly enough, would, from the slave groups, pull out a sacrificial victim. This is one sacrifice, so this is almost symbolic here. Now, for a year, they would make this person into a lavish celebrity. They would allow them all sorts of carnal and gluttonous pleasures, but they would also, if they started to get fat, they would force salt water down their throat and make them vomit until they got thin again, because of course they need to be beautiful to be sacrificed. Now, they converted the chosen into a sacred vessel, even though of course this is a slave from the outside that they just sort of adopted, right? Now this person would embody their sacrifice, their gift as this ultimate scapegoat. So this is their largesse, foisted upon this youth. And this is their excessive accumulation, their material wealth, taking sacred or religious form. Now, I'm gonna draw a sort of a weird comparison here, but does this not sound like something that happens in Hollywood or on reality television, even on the internet? That we lift somebody up, worship them for a moment, and then crush them and throw them away. So you can see how these two people the Bataille and Gerards, they dovetail together, right? Our excesses create tensions that demand release. So this is back to cybernetic theory. Gerard says violence comes from mimetic desire. Somebody models it. This model catalyzes society. Then tensions rise until violence ensues. Of course, we turn our violence outward, almost always to the fringes. And I'm repeating this, right? We turn it to some small group of outsiders upon whom we will place the blame. We drive them into the ground, and for just a moment, we feel cathartic release. Now, this is where things get weird, is because we all share in the sin, the irrationality of this. Well, we somehow have to justify it to ourselves, so we attempt to make it true. This is where we become more religious, ideological, patriotic. To admit that you killed an innocent because you cannot control your petty emotions, your individual emotions, is really a pill too large for most people to swallow. All scapegoating, 
all religious or orgiastic festivals, riots, even Black Friday, are the result of an inability to channel our will in proper directions. It is a failure of individuals that manifests as societal terror. Okay, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, now, of course, I find these ideas compelling because, of course, once you start looking for medic models and how people react to each other, yeah, all this starts to seem very obvious. So, yeah, I think the next episode will be another layer of this, right? We're going to talk about camouflage, ways of disguising, and ways of mimicry, which all, of course, factors into how we hide our models, how we protect ourselves, even if it's only to be violent later on. Now, if you learned anything today, or if you enjoyed any part of this episode, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, please consider liking, rating, reviewing the podcast. And of course, I could always use more support from my listeners. Now, you might just want to sign up for our monthly emails at letusthinkaboutit.com, or you could send me a one-time $5 donation. That would be greatly appreciated. Now, if you really want to support the work that I'm doing, please consider the $5 per month option. Thank you again for your time. This is Ryder Richards, wishing you happiness and safety.